The Veiled One by That Town Guy. In the heart of the dense, shadow-draped forest where the twisted branches whispered secrets and ancient trees stood sentinel in silence, a creature lurked that instilled terror into the bravest of souls. The locals spoke in hushed tones about the legend of the Veiled One, a monstrous entity that dwelled in the darkest corners of the forest. The tale began with friends seeking adventure, their laughter echoing throughout the moonlit clearing as they set up camp for the night. A night fire crackled, casting dancing shadows on the towering trees surrounding them. As the night wore on, their animated stories faded into subdued whispers and a chill settled over the air. Unbeknownst to the campers, the Veiled One emerged from deep within the forest. Its presence was felt rather than seen, an evil force that stirred the essence of fear in the hearts of those unlucky to cross its path. The temperature dropped and an eerie mist slithered through the underbrush, wrapping the trees in a spectral embrace. One by one, all the campers succumbed to an inexplicable unease. A rustle in the leaves, a distant howl, and the feeling of unseen eyes watching them caused the group to exchange nervous glances. As the night deepened, an unsettling quiet descended upon the campsite, broken only by the distant hooting of an owl. In the silence, one of the campers, Sarah, ventured into the woods to relieve herself. She moved cautiously, the damp leaves underfoot muffling her steps. The shadows seemed to elongate, twisting into grotesque shapes that played tricks on her mind. A whisper, barely audible, murmured her name from the shadows. Sarah. She froze, her breath caught in her throat. The whisper grew more insistent, drawing her deeper into the labyrinth woods. Panic set in as the familiar landmarks blurred and she realized she was lost. The once familiar trees stood like looming specters, and the moon struggled to pierce the thick canopy above. As Sarah stumbled through the underbrush, the forest seemed alive with sinister energy. The air thickened, and the whispers became unholy chants resonating with ancient power. Shadows danced at the edge of her vision, and a pair of glowing eyes maternalized before her. The eyes of the Veiled One. A guttural growl echoed through the darkness, and Sarah's instinct screamed at her to flee. She sprinted through the twisted trees, branches clawing at her face, the creature hot on her heels. Desperation fueled her, and she burst into the clearing where the campsite should have been. The campsite had vanished. To her horror, only leaving a barren expanse of twisted roots in cold earth, the whispers intensified, now a cacophony of hateful voices. The veiled one closed in, a looming figure wraithed in shadows. In a final act of defiance, Sarah turned to face the creature. Its proper form remained hidden beneath a tattered cloak of darkness. The whispers grew louder, drowning out her screams as the Veiled One enveloped her in inky tendrils. The following day, the remaining campers awoke to find the clearing intact, the fire still flickering, yet Sarah was gone, swallowed by the ancient woods, her fate sealed by the evil presence that roamed the shadows. The Veiled One, a creature that waited patiently for the next unsuspecting soul to wander into its domain, never to be heard from again. I would like to think that this creature just disappeared, or that no more campers went in those woods, but truly, I have not the slightest clue. White Creatures in the Woods by Anonymous I have seen hundreds of these things at night in the woods in the rural areas around Memphis starting around 2020. They are tall, humanoid creatures with blacked out eyes, moving slowly and in strange, jerky movements. The first time I saw them, I was visiting a veteran friend, 
who was down on his luck. It was sometime around midnight on Thanksgiving Day in 2020. He lived on his brother's property in a rundown camper vehicle at the edge of the woods between his camper and the tree line. There were the remains of an old trailer that had been destroyed by a tornado in years past, with a street light on top of the pole that was used to run electricity to the destroyed mobile home on the other side of the pole, which was approximately 15 yards of a field that had a dirt road that split in half with tall grass and brush at the edge of the far side. Then the tree line would start it on the opposite. They were people hiding at first. They seemed to be grouping more in the darker areas where the light from the pole was not as bright. I asked my friend about them and shrugged it off and said they were always there and they didn't bother them. He also said that no matter what you did, you couldn't get close to one, no matter how fast you were. So being a combat veteran with two deployments under my belt and my firearm from my vehicle, I attempted to approach these things. As I got closer, I noticed they were solid white creatures with solid black eye sockets that moved in a jerky but prolonged manner. There had to be at least 50 or more in that field, down the dirt road, and at the edge of the tree line and beyond. Determined to let something mess around and find out, I continued to walk towards them, and all of a sudden, they looked at me with black, empty-looking sockets, and instantly caused me to feel more fear than I have ever remembered having in my lifetime. I did not approach them that night. I turned away, left the area, and took my buddy to stay a few days in my place. Since the first time I saw them, I have seen them about a dozen times always at night and around wooded areas at different locations. I have since tried to run and catch them and fail because the creature simply disappears the moment I close in within 5 to 10 yards. Anytime I lose direct eye contact for a mere flash of a second, they seemingly up and vanish. It's like they can phase in or out or something. If you get in close, you can see the weird jerky movements is like a part of them. Their arms, legs, and head seem to all move at different times and in different positions. They disappear any time they move, so they cannot be seen if they walk. I have pumped 45 incendiary rounds from my AR-15 into one without a single shred of evidence of it left behind. These things make audible noise that can be recorded but do not show up on a video or any cell phone recording. I have brought out old analog camcorders with cassette tapes and don't even see anything happening as well. I don't know if they have some sort of frequency thing that they can do to avoid all of these things, but it's very un of this earth. Animals also see them. However, I have tried to show them to people, and only about half of those I have shown them to see them. I have wondered if I was losing my mind, and if anyone else has seen them and tried other experiments like I have. I have searched all over the internet, and only found a few cryptic creatures that share one or two similar things with them, but nothing comes close enough to say that it's a match. The only close thing was the origin of white zombies. Sort of, anyway. A few people tell me this could be a shape-shifting creature. They are different sizes, some more prominent, some smaller, and they do group up in what I have come to call family clusters, four to five of them, usually with two taller ones and one or two smaller ones. The Cave Creature by Emo Lover 115 I was around 11 years old in this story. For context, my friends, I, Evie, Gail, and Liam, all loved playing in the sagebrush fields by my neighborhood and exploring the cliffs that looked over the valley. I was always the ringleader of the group bringing them along to chase rabbits, catch snakes, or build forts below the cliffs. Just dumb kid stuff. One day, Evie told me that a friend of hers found two caves in the sagebrush and gave her directions to find them herself. I thought this would be perfect for a group adventure, so I rounded up my friends to search for these caves. The first one was at the bottom of a smallish cliff, 
So we climbed down, one by one. It was clearly a hangout spot for teenagers or something, since the ground was littered with empty beer cans and liquor bottles. The rocky walls were covered in graffiti, and there was an old tattered blanket in the furthest corner. However, there was nothing of interest to a bunch of 6th graders, so we moved on. The second cave was way smaller. Not even one person could fit inside. I guess if you really wanted to, you could cram yourself in and sit down. But it was extremely claustrophobic. All four of us huddled around the mouth of the cave, peering inside. Of course, I was closest and could see more than others, and noticed a wide tunnel that led deep into the rocks. In the very back of that tunnel, I caught movement. I looked closer, squinting my eyes to adjust to the darkness, trying to figure out if I was actually seeing something. There was a medium-sized animal, if you could even call it that, facing away from us, crouched over and breathing heavily. It was pretty much bald, with a few clumps of hair in its back. It was incredibly thin, I could see the outline of its spine and ribs. Gale, look! I pointed down the tunnel and moved away so he could see. He hesitated before speaking. What is that? I was relieved that he saw it too, but the feeling of unease became stronger the more time we spent near the cave. How would I know? I responded. I moved closer to look at it again. Liam and Evie both stood a safe distance, nervous and preparing to escape if something went horribly wrong. I think they also felt the lingering sense of danger, but were smart enough to stay away. My 11-year-old brain thought the best course of action was to pick up a rock and hit the thing with it to try to make it move, and thinking back on it, that was the worst possible thing I could have done. My friends watched as I grabbed a rock off the ground and chucked it hard, hitting the thing right in the back. As soon as the rock struck it, the thing swung its head around and stared at me with these horrific, blank eyes that ripped through my soul and nearly made me crap my pants. Adrenaline and utter terror surged through my body, and I did not stick around to see if that thing was coming after me. I nearly fell down the side of the cliff climbing up to safety. My friends were equally as terrified, repeatedly asking if what I saw actually happened. Neither me or Gail had a solid answer as to what that thing was, just a description of those dreadful eyes and its bare skin in the dark corner. Unknown Creature by Professional Walk I was out camping in the woods with a group of friends when we encountered something that still gives me chills to this day. It was late at night, and we were huddled around the campfire, telling ghost stories and roasting marshmallows. Suddenly, we heard a strange noise coming from the trees. It sounded like a low growl, but it was unlike any animal noise we had ever heard before. We shrugged it off and continued with our night, but the sound grew louder and more frequent as the night wore on, and it became increasingly harder to try to ignore it or pass it off as some sort of animal. At one point, we heard something moving in the bushes nearby. We shone our flashlights in the direction of the noise, but we couldn't see or make out anything. It was much too dark and too dense with trees and brush. As the night progressed, the noises grew more and more intense. We could hear something moving around our campsite, circling like a shark, but we couldn't see anything in the darkness. It was like something was watching us, stalking us from the shadows. We decided to pack up and leave, but as we started to gather our things, we heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the trees. It was a sound that made our hearts stop in terror. We could feel something watching us, waiting for us to make a move. We ran. We ran as fast as we could back to our car but we could hear something following us, hot on our heels. It was like the creature was right there, waiting to get us, waiting for somebody to slip. It was like it was breathing down our necks. We finally made it to the car and sped away, our hearts pounding in our chest. To this day, we still don't know what the heck that creature was. We don't know what we encountered in the woods that night. It was something unknown, unexplainable, something that still haunts our memories and makes us shiver with fear. A Night in Horror by Electrical Line 6982 My name is Heinrich, and I live in Sweden. I will tell you a story that happened to me years ago. 
but I will never forget it. The worst night and time of my life. I apologize already now that my English is not the best, but I hope you still understand anyway. In 2004, I worked as a forklift driver at a large furniture company in the small town of Husqvarna in Sweden. I loaded and unloaded trucks and collected goods that were going with them. I moved there after school with some friends, who also worked at the same company. I met a girl, and everything went well, and I lived life. But in 2007, it came to a break with my girlfriend, and my friends from school had started to move away so I felt that I didn't have much left in Husqvarna. I started thinking about moving away, maybe going back home to my childhood town of Karlstad, which is 300 kilometers north, where my parents and childhood friends still lived. Karlstad is close to the border with Norway, and one of my friends, Tobias, has started to work as a forklift driver for a Norwegian company in Oslo. A Swede earns almost three times more to work in Norway than in Sweden so many Swedes try to get a job there. So when my friend Tobias from Norway said I could come to Oslo and look for a job at the company he worked for, I didn't hesitate. To get to Oslo from Husqvarna, you must drive about an hour west towards Gothenburg, Sweden's second largest city, and from there, move the other four hours on a highway called E6 with two lanes in both directions with some wire railing between the north going side and the south going side. The south going side moves through primarily dense forest. In fall and winter time, the E6 is heavily trafficked by trucks and other heavy vehicles. As a rule, trucks drive in the right lane, while other faster traffic goes in the left. But during August, many truck drivers are on vacation. So, at the evenings and nights, E6 is pretty much empty. So on August 24th, 2007, I started traveling by car towards Oslo from Husqvarna, a distance of almost five hours. The idea was to stay for some hours or so, and then go home again. So I left early in the morning and arrived at lunchtime in Oslo. I met my friend Tobias and got to go with him to his job and meet his boss. We talked and joked around, and I immediately formed an excellent bond with the boss. And soon... I submitted my application to start working there. Afterward, my friend Tobias and I hung out at his apartment, we talked, ate, and had a good hangout. I forgot to pay attention to the time, and then I noticed it was already 11pm. Realizing I must go home now, I said goodbye to my friend, jumped into my car, and began my 5 hour journey home. I moved away from Oslo, and went into the dark, dense forest for an hour. It was a full moon so you could still see pretty well, even without street lights. After driving for an hour and now finding myself with a dense forest on both sides of me, I see in the rear view mirror how a car, a Volvo 240, pulls up behind me very close. I don't drive too fast or too slow, and since it's a two lane road, I think that if they're in a hurry they can just overtake me in the other lane. After a while, they did overtake me and pass me, but then, they turn right into the right corner of the road and stop in front of me. I must quickly turn into the left lane to avoid crashing into the Volvo. I look into the rearview mirror as I continue driving, and soon they get up behind me again and are very close. And soon they overtake me again, and this time they drive away a bit and then turn into the right lane. Again they stop, and then the back door of the Volvo opens, and a massive man in his 30s jumps out and walks toward my car. I'm starting to feel uncomfortable about this, so I'm definitely not going to stop. I turn around again, go into the left lane, and pass the man in the car. As I drive by, I see the man trying to grab the door on the passenger side of my car. Now, I absolutely panic and increase my speed to get away from them, but they catch up to me and do an overtake again. They stop a little way ahead, and soon the same man jumps out again and tries to make another attempt at my door. The drive continues and the same thing repeats itself over and over again. Soon I catch up with another car and I get behind this car, hoping that the people in the Volvo will get scared and give up because we are now not alone on the road anymore. But when I lay down behind this car, they and the Volvo overtake me and the other vehicle and lay down in front of us. The vehicle between us must feel threatened because after some short time, the car between us drives out on the left lane, overtakes the Volvo chasing me and accelerates and soon disappears. 
I pick up my mobile and dial the emergency number for Sweden, which is 112. But the automatic voice operator says the number is not in use. Since I am in Norway, the Swedish emergency number does not work and I did not know the Norwegian emergency number right then and there, I call my dad and hope he's awake. My dad answers while the hunt continues in the same way as before. I explain with panic what is happening and want him to help me find the emergency number to Norway. My father is a very calm individual and rarely gets upset. He probably didn't understand the seriousness of the situation either, so he said, Take it easy, try to drive away from them and stop and then ask what they want. After a few attempts to get my dad to cooperate without success, he's clearly not getting it. So I hung up and threw the phone in frustration in the passenger seat so that it bounced down between the floor and the heart and disappeared under the passenger seat. Soon, I am approaching Halden, a small Norwegian town. I see a sign showing an exit lane to the right. I think that now I am saved. I can turn off the E6 and the car chasing me can hopefully leave me alone. But to turn into the exit lane, I have to slow down. When I slow down, the car chasing me comes and drives around up on the exit lane in front of me and parks across it at the end so that I can't go off the exit lane and exit the E6 because they're now blocking me entirely. So, with nowhere to turn, I have to continue on the E6 and the panic is now massive. I'm terrified and now I decide that they won't be allowed to overtake me again before I border to Sweden. So, I accelerate up to 160 kilometers an hour and they don't manage to overtake me. They only tend to drive up so that they are almost level with me. I look towards them and see how four people in the car are sitting, shouting something at me, and lunging to try to run into my car with their vehicle. We will soon be coming up to a large suspension bridge between Norway and Sweden. I panic and think that if they run over me or if I lose control of the car at this speed, I will fall through the railing and down about 50 meters if not more. But we get off the bridge, and shortly afterward, there is a small truck stop where trucks stop and rest and show customs officers what they have in their cargo. I quickly turn off, and those in the Volvo continue, and I see how they disappear on the E6. I stop in a parking lot inside the truck stop and just... breathe. Now, finally it's over. I thought. But it turned out this was far from over. I bent down toward the passenger seat and tried to find the mobile phone that was under there. But I can't find it, so I leave and walk towards the customs house, which is closed. But there is a payphone outside, and I pick up the phone and dial the emergency number 112, and arrive and get connected to the police. I explained what has happened and where I am now. They tell me to get back in the car, and a police car will come within 10 minutes. I thank them and get back in the car. And I'm afraid those people in the Volvo will show up again after 40 minutes without the police. So I go out to the phone and again call. They retake my report and even though I say that I called and reported about 40 minutes ago, they tell me to again wait in my car and the police will eventually be there. Although that I say that I am happy to stay on the phone with them until the police arrive, but they promise me they'll be there in a few minutes. So I hang up again. I go and sit down in the car and wait. Another 30 minutes pass without any police showing up. I sit and think about driving on. Partly, I'm afraid that they'll come back here, and then I just want to go home. So after a few minutes and another attempt to find my cell phone under the seat with no success, I decide to drive on. It has been at least 90 minutes since I stopped here now, and the people in the Volvo have not come back here. So I think they are now moved on, and it must be far enough away for me to be able to start making my way home. I leave the truck stop and drive out onto the E6 again. I drive for just a few minutes and come to a left turn. When I make the turn and come around to the crest of a new straight, I see to my horror, this Volvo is parked in a small parking lot next to the road. I break to a stop and immediately feel the panic. I'm standing about 50 meters away. I'm considering turning around and driving against traffic to avoid passing them, but I don't have time to think more because the back door opens, two people get out and start walking toward my car. Another person gets out of the passenger side. The Volvo then opens the trunk and starts picking something out that I can't quite see what it is. When the other two men start walking toward me, they turn to the left side of my car and start walking toward my door. Then, I don't even know, I don't even think, I just press my gas all the way to the bottom and drive away. 
I look in the rearview mirror and see silhouettes of the people running toward the Volvo again. And I now see from the lights of the Volvo. And I now see the lights from the Volvo start up and shine toward me. I now understand that they are now taking up the chase again. I keep driving and realize I have a bit of a lead now. I was looking in the rearview mirror and saw them in the distance. A badger runs out in front of my car when I look ahead again. I don't even have time to steer away. I just run it over with the left front of my back wheels. Right after I drive over, I hear something from the car scraping against the asphalt. Something has come loose after the collision. In panic and terror, I must get off the E6 now. Terrified that the car will break down and give up, soon there is a minor exit on the left which I quickly turn onto and get away from the E6. When I arrive a little way up, I see a sign from a small village that is about two kilometers away. I can't remember the name of the town now. So I start driving on this smaller road towards the village, and I still hear how it scrapes under the car. Then I see a small forest and to the right at the turn in the street, I no longer see the Volvo in the rearview mirror. And in a panic to get far away from the E6 and big roads, I turn into this forest road and continue into the trees. The road is very narrow. There are two ruts, the grass is in the middle, and around the car are large trees. I drive further into the forest road until I come to an end of the road, and it's just more forest. I manage to turn the car around, and now I'm facing the direction I came from. I turn off the engine and exhale. Everything around me is quiet and dark, but soon I can see between the trees far away two headlights approaching. The panic returns. They have seen where I turned off somehow, and now they are coming yet again. I see it's them, and when they break through the trees I realize now that it's just survival that counts. I take my wallet and car keys. The mobile is where it is. I get out of the car, close and lock it. I put my wallet in my pocket, turn around and start running into the forest as fast as possible. I hear people in the Volvo calling for me. I run more profoundly and deeper into the woods. After some time, I reach a small clearing and see a large stone under a very big tree. I climb onto that rock, grab the tree branches and climb up. There are thick leaves on the components and soon I have risen to the middle of the tree and I am entirely hidden. I sit down on a thick branch against the tree trunk, breathe and listen. I am convinced that I will not survive this night. They will find me and now I can do no more to get away and no one knows where I am. I think of my friends and my parents. Will they ever find me out here? Will they ever know what happened to me or will I just become a missing person case? When I sit and I think about it, I hear how they are walking in the forest, looking for me in the distance, shouting, We'll find you! But luckily, they never came near my tree. I hear how they get deeper and deeper into the forest, but soon they turn and go back. I see everything through the leaves, their flashlights as they search through the woods. I soon hear how they continue back towards the cars. Then it's quiet. I dare not leave the tree. I stay there until it's morning and the sun has risen. Then, I climb down very slowly and very thoroughly and walk quietly back towards the car. At this point, I'm absolutely terrified that they will be standing there waiting. I'm pretty sure they wrecked my car, but when I go to the road again, I see my car. The Volvo is nowhere to be found. It seems they haven't even touched my car. After this, I just... I just went home. I tried to forget all about it. Until this day, I don't know what their case was all about and what they wanted, or what would have happened if I had let them talk to me. Honestly, I'm terrified to find out. Dad! Casey yelled. The stupid disposal is jammed again. She leaned forward and scowled down the drain. It was burbling something brownish, chunky. She wrinkled her nose. It had been coughing up the same nasty gunk for days. Whatever it was, was all over the edges of the sink and counter, like dried on pizza sauce. No matter how much she yelled up the stairs, her father never came down to deal with it. It's super gross, she added, still hollering. It smells like old hot dogs. Casey's phone buzzed on the kitchen counter beside her. She snatched it up and grinned at her best friend's name flashing across the notifications. Her mind emptied instantly, like an upturned drawer. She didn't notice the disposal still churning and sputtering. If her father had bothered to walk downstairs, he would have started lecturing her about breaking the motor. It's an old house, he always said. 
An old system. You gotta take care of it or it'll come back to bite ya. Lena. Basketball team captain at Westlake is throwing this huge party tonight. The disposal glugged and growled. It vomited up a chip of something whitish. Like a bit of chicken bone. Casey's eyes glowed with delight, but they stayed locked on her screen. Casey. Serious? Lena. And someone's wonderful smart best friend got both of us invites. Casey. Serious? Excitement flared in Casey's belly. No one invited ninth graders to real parties. Lena. Of course I'm serious. We can come pick you up. You're with your madre or padre this weekend. Casey hesitated. She glanced up the stairs. Her father was probably up there working on some five million piece puzzle or carving another crappy wooden duck. If she went up there and asked, he would start lecturing her about chores and boys and her turn to make dinner. As if reading her mind, he groaned down the stairs, Feed me, Casey. I'm hungry. Reason number 52,000 it was better at her mom's house where they had the unspoken agreement to sit on their phones and totally ignore each other. Where, when, and how Casey went out, her mom only really ever said, Have fun. Casey's mind spun with an idea. She could make up a big project for her history class and tell her dad she was going to the library or something stupid like that. Something her dad would actually approve of. The garbage disposal growled, guttural, hungry. Her father's voice echoed through the house. Feed me. Casey. I'm at the dictator's house and I have to pay him respects in the form of dinner before he kills my dreams. Lena shot back a gif of a woman covering her mouth, trying not to laugh. The disposal glug glugged more. She rolled her eyes and left it on. At least if it was 100% broken, her dad would actually fix it, and maybe clean up his mess while he was at it. Hey dad, I'm going to the library with Lena. I'll probably be back late, but I'll put on some, um... Casey opened the fridge door. She scowled until she saw it. A glass jar full of something red. It had meaty chunks of her dad's usual homemade tomato sauce. Pasta. I'll put on some pasta, okay? Her father called back, gurgling. Feed me. Casey scoffed under her breath. Rude. But he just kept going, saying the same thing over and over. Casey leaned against the counter and put in her earbuds to drown out her dad. Soon, Electric Viper's newest album thrummed in her ears. Casey couldn't hear anything as she pulled out a pot from the cabinet. She hummed as she popped open her father's spaghetti sauce. Then she froze. There was a fingernail floating on top. She glanced back to the thick red liquid sputtering from the disposal. A pair of yellow eyes stared back at her, rippling under the filthy water. Casey shrieked and staggered backwards. A pair of rotten arms shot out of the sink. They were slick and mucousy, pocked with old food and rot. The music was still blaring as those hands dragged her down into the sink. Her cheeks clapped against the cold porcelain, her skull like an egg. She heard herself crying. Dad! Dad! Please! The voice roared over the music, louder than anything. Feed! When Casey's mother arrived to pick her up the next day, the house was empty. She found Casey's phone on the counter, full of dozens of unread messages and a pot on the floor. Jack? Casey's mother called. Casey? The garbage disposal was running, puking up something brownish and stinking of rot. Jeez, Jack. She said under her breath. You could keep this place cleaner, you know. If she had opened the fridge, she would have seen a second jar there beside the first. It was only half the size, and soon the family would be complete. Casey's mother reached for the switch on the wall. She was too busy texting her ex-husband to notice the yellow eyes watching her. The ravenous smile, made of a dozen people's teeth, wedged in to a multi face. I'm hungry. It hissed. Feed me.
If you enjoyed this story and would like to hear more stories similar to this, be sure to check out Too Scared to Sleep. You can find links to purchase the book down below. 30 short scary stories with 30 short scary movies. It's definitely something you're going to want to check out. Another fun thing that the author is currently doing is giving away three books that they have written every single month for free. That's right, every single month, Andrew will be giving away three books of your choice every single month for free. All you have to do is buy Too Scared to Sleep, click on the link in the description, provide your name and email, and you may be able to win three books of your choice every single month. Sarah hated being grounded more than anything. She sat in her room, angry and bored, looking for something, anything to do, besides fixate on the crack under her door. It glowed, which meant the kitchen lights were on. Her parents were still up, so she was still banished to her room. Sarah paused, considering her options. Her parents would certainly be angry if she left her room now. They had already grounded her for texting at dinner and had taken her phone. She didn't dare risk making it worse. Never mind that she was 14 and being sent to a room was totally humiliating. Having a phone was her social lifeline. She could practically feel the dozens of unanswered messages calling to her from the other room. The minutes ticked by and her anger turned to boredom. What was she supposed to even do? She hadn't opened her toy crate since she was a young girl, but tonight was not the night to be mature. She was phoneless, lonely, and bored. She lifted the latch up on the mangled old box and dug through the piles of stuffed animals. Their plastic eyes winked at her in the low light. Many of them were disfigured than she remembered, but the one she was looking for, her stuffed rabbit, Mr. Butterscotch, was sitting right on top with a big smile stitched onto his face. The same smile that had always cheered her up whenever she was down. His fur was worn, revealing the spots where he had served as a tissue for her tears. He had originally been a gift on her second birthday, and after that they were inseparable. He was her favorite toy and her closest friend. Sarah brought Mr. Butterscotch with her everywhere the doctor, the store, sometimes even the movies. As long as Mr. Butterscotch was there, she felt safe and happy. But Sarah grew up. She made friends at school. She got a phone. Nowadays, she spent her evenings hanging out with her friends online or texting. Sarah didn't need him anymore. She'd put him in her toy chest and forgotten about him. But now, Grasping him as she once had, resting her nose on his head in that familiar spot, the fond memories came flooding back. She'd always been the best listener. She sat Mr. Butterscotch on her pillow and let it all tumble out, weeping and telling him how horribly unfair it all was, how she wished she didn't have parents at all. It was nice to vent to someone, even if it felt a little childish. Mr. Butterscotch sat there listening, his beady eyes staring at her, his smile fixed in place. Long after the tears ran dry, Sarah must have dozed off because some time later, she jerked awake with her head in a start. In a fog of hunger and confusion, she lifted her head from her pillow. It was 3.30 in the morning. The whole house smelled freshly of roasted meat. Mr. Butterscotch was nowhere to be seen. Hadn't she left him on her pillow? And why would her parents be cooking at this hour? Sarah climbed out of bed, pushed open the door, and light spilled in, cutting a yellow crease across her bedroom floor. Her stuffed animals seemed to raise their fleecy paws in good luck or maybe even a goodbye. She blinked hard and squinted into the darkness, and they were immobile statues once more. Her mind must have been playing tricks on her, surely. She crept down the hall. The honey-sweet scent of fat cooking grew stronger as she tiptoed into the empty kitchen. She turned her head this way and that, looking for shapes in the gloom. 
signs of her parents. All the lights in the house were dead except for the kitchen. Even the dining room adjacent to the kitchen was dark, except for a tidy row of candles set up among a feast of covered silver trays. Her mother's finest dishware. Sarah hadn't seen it used since her grandmother died. But there it was, laid out in the middle of the night, like a feast for ghosts. Sarah hugged her arms over her chest. She peered into the oven. The huge tray her parents always used for Thanksgiving dinner sat in there, covered in a half globe of tinfoil. Hunger tumbled and twisted in her belly. The oven timer chirped, making Sarah yelp in surprise. She turned, expecting to see her father emerge from the dark to scold her for being out of bed. But the familiar shape that shuffled closer was too small to be her parents. For a moment, she thought it might be her dog, Daisy, lumbering over to beg for table scraps. But this figure walked up right on two furry black legs, and its tall ears twitched as it hopped along. Mr. Butterscotch? Sarah gasped. She almost questioned why he was moving on his own, but she stifled that impulse. Obviously, this was just a dream. What are you doing out of bed? She asked instead. You missed out on dinner. Her stuffed animal flopped up to her with a ragdoll looseness. He looked sweet and silly, his little stitched mouth smiling up at her. So I made you one. Oh, you kind old rabbit. She picked him up and cradled him. Mr. Butterscotch blinked, his eyes flat and unreadable. Something stained the tips of his paws. Perhaps it was sauce from cooking. It reminded her of pennies, but she couldn't quite think of why. Mr. Butterscotch wriggled out of her arms. He gestured toward the dimly lit dining room table. Shall we? A question lingered in Sarah's gut, poisoning her appetite. She paused. Where are mom and dad? The rabbit's stitched lips curled, and for the first time she saw that he had teeth. Little triangles of felt poked out of his smile. Right here. Mr. Butterscott slipped past her and opened the oven door. He pulled out the tray bare pawed as if his little furry paws could not feel the blazing heat. He set it on the counter and peeled back the aluminum cover. Inside, oil sizzled at the bottom of the pan. The scent was unlike anything she had just smelled before, rich and sharp in her nose. A shank of meat sat in the tray, steam clouding up off it. A sharp tooth of bone stuck out from the cooked flesh. The stuffed rabbit gave her another toothy smile. He nodded toward the dining room table. Please, he said. Sit down, our feast is about to begin. Sarah turned back to do as her bunny told her. All of this had the comforting haze of a dream. Surely that's all it was. If her toys were coming to life and speaking to her, that was when a jolt of color caught her eye. A streak of scarlet smeared the doorframe. It was low at eye level and it too smelled like old coins. She leaned to peer down the hall. The door leading to her parents' room hung ajar. The blood smear led past the door into the darkness beyond. Mom? She whispered. Dad? The room answered with silence. It would be easy to check to see if they were there. Just nudge the door open. Just look for the familiar shape of them sleeping in the gloom. But somehow... She knew if she opened the door, there would be no going back. Sarah dared glance at Mr. Butterscotch, who was too busy slicing the meat to notice her. She pinched her own arm forward, willing herself to wake up, but the room around her stayed the same and the smell of Mr. Butterscotch's feast still dizzied her. It made her woozy, nauseous even. This was real. The blood on her parents' door was real. Her stuffed rabbit puttered around the kitchen, whistling happily. Should I put some juice on the table? Sarah's pulse quickened as she gingerly pulled open a utensil drawer and reached in to grab the sharpest knife she could find. A dull steak knife. Not much, but it would have to do. She held it behind her back. I don't think my mom and dad would like that. They said I shouldn't have sugar late at night. We don't have to worry about what they think. Not tonight. This is our feast. Mr. Butterscotch skipped past her to put the tray of meat on the table. Shall we eat? You must be hungry. Indignation tightened Sarah's throat. She gripped the knife tighter, only her hand was slippery from sweat. Not yet. 
Her stuffed animal hopped the table, his ears bobbing with a looseness she used to find endearing. But now there was a menace to it. What was that phrase her mother told her? A wolf in sheep's clothing. Mr. Butterscotch didn't seem to notice her pause. He set the last serving tray on the table. Come along, Sarah, he chided. Your dinner is going to get cold. He impaled a sliver of meat on a fork and slapped it onto the closest plate. Sarah couldn't even bring herself to move. Not until my mom and dad are here. Now the toy rabbit started giggling to himself. In a warped, delighted voice, he said, Silly girl, they're already here. He leaned over to the center serving tray, her mother's finest silver. He wrapped a bloody paw around it and lifted the lid. Her mother's head stared back at her, mirroring Sarah's shocked look in her lifeless eyes. Steam rose from the wrinkled, cooked skin overlaying those once familiar features. Sarah held the knife even tighter. She swallowed the urge to vomit. Mr. Butterscotch watched her hungrily. Now sit down, he said in a wheezing, sing-song voice. Or join your parents over there. Sarah shuffled closer. She sat down slowly. Go on. Give your mother a taste. The rabbit leaned in, its button eyes glowing with unholy delight in the light of the chandelier. After all, you said you wished you didn't have parents. Bile rose in Sarah's mouth. She swung out with the knife. The dull blade caught and tore the fabric flesh of the rabbit's belly. Cotton spilled out of the open wound. The bunny looked between her and the knife in a mild surprise. Oh dear, Mr. Butterscotch said. It seems you've chosen to join the feast, but not in the way I had hoped. Then again, you've always been selfish, Sarah, casting others aside when you are finished with them. After everything we've been through, and for what? To be replaced by a screen? I'd hoped we could start again, but now it's time for you to get a taste of your own medicine. Wait, Sarah tried. But the rabbit lunged, arcing in a fork toward her throat, silencing her forever. The house smelled of meat long into the morning. Is there a better disguise than your bunny with the cute button eyes? What if that bunny has fears about how you've changed through the years? and no longer listens to your cries, and no longer cares about your tears. My Family Saw a UFO by From Here to There To give you some context, I am from a large family of 11 children. We lived in many rural towns in the Midwest, and at the time of this encounter, the city we lived in had less than 300 people. The closest town was 25 minutes away, and we needed a local police department. In our village, there was a road that led to a vast canyon where some of the residents of that small town lived. One of the families up there taught vocal lessons, so... My mom and three sisters were headed home from there when something strange happened. They were driving along the dirt canyon road when suddenly lights were all around the car from directly above them. My mom sped up and suddenly the lights were on top of the hill where they were approaching and they noticed that it was a round craft with multicolored lights shining down underneath it. My mom pulled over to take a moment to look at it and the second she parked, the craft started moving towards them again, but very slowly. My mom slammed it into gear and sped out of the canyon, the lights following them the entire time. I was very young at the time, being the youngest, but I remember them coming in and frantically talking about lights following them home. My dad and I ran outside, and out next to our house. We had a detached garage and workshop and a UFO was hovering above the garage in perfect silence. We just kind of stared at it. It never landed, and just after a few moments, the thing disappeared within seconds, going like light year speed. There was no sound or gust of wind from the takeoff. It just was there, and then it was gone. I remember thinking I should feel scared at the time, but for some reason, none of us really felt afraid of it until it was gone. I was surprised but we didn't really feel like we were in danger in the moment. 
and never did come back, and I've never had an experience like this ever since. But it's... it's something I'll, I'll forever remember. The silence. I'll, I'll forever remember the silence. How can something like that... How can something that big move that fast, be that silent? It still intrigues me 30 years later and has hooked me on UFO sightings ever since. The Bump in the Woods by Anonymous I love the woods and always have. The peace and serenity it brings me is unmatched. That being said, I experienced something that I still have trouble explaining. Hunting is tremendous in my hometown and the state, so I decided to try to bag a deer three seasons ago. I set up my tree stand and cameras, put out some feed, and would sit out there for hours, just waiting for some unlucky deer to walk by. The land I had permission to hunt was near my family's home, so I could walk to my stand. The land surrounds a bridge for the railroad, the tracks are over the gravel road with a creek that constantly floods. In school, it was a favorite spooky activity that we would go to this bridge that has a lot of history because my town used to be a sundown town and in the days of segregation, if a person of color was caught outside after the sun was down, they were hung from the bridge. Many lives were snuffed out under that. I had been sitting in my stand and the sun quickly descended. It isn't safe to hunt after the sun goes down, regardless. As I was about to climb, a small buck walked out of the tree line. I sat and watched him. I noticed he was limping. His front leg was broken and I was always taught to show mercy when I saw something like this. So I drew my bow and shot. After the shot, he ran off and I slowly climbed down to begin tracking the blood. After 30 minutes of no luck finding him, I called my friend, who was a good tracker. When he showed up, we started following the trail again. By this time, the sun had gone down entirely and was pitch black. After tracking for an hour or so, we finally spotted him lying at the base of a large tree. I had called my brother to bring his truck so we could get the deer home and process it. So my friend Jay and I sat and waited for him to show up. Sitting in the pitch black, we were enjoying the silence when the sound of pounding footsteps snapped the silence. The footsteps were heavy and fast and were not an animal. It was bipedal and was quick. Jay and I sat there in awe, and I will never forget the look on Jay's face and the horror in his eyes. We decided to stand up and discover who or what was out there. We flipped on our headlamps and started yelling, Who's out there? No response came, and the silence returned. No footsteps were running away, and no other noises were heard. My brother showed up not long after, and we loaded the deer. Jay and I decided it was probably one of the poor spirits stuck under the bridge, and the deer blood attracted it, or maybe it was something else. This isn't my only experience near this bridge, but that is a story for another day. I Swear I Saw Her by No Interaction When I was about 10 years old, I was alone in a part of the schoolyard during the morning break. In the country I lived in back then, it was common for schools to have two breaks, a 30 to 45 minute long one in the morning and a one hour long one at lunchtime. There was a tall, big tree there, and I was sitting on one of the large roots that stuck out of the ground. Suddenly, I heard someone approaching me. I turned to see who it was and noticed it was one of my friends. She said, I bet you can't catch me. I told her I could do it and we started running around the tree while I tried to reach her and catch her. We were both laughing, and she was right. She was too fast for me to get her. Then, one of my classmates yelled my name. I stopped running around and turned. The boy who called my name asked, What are you doing running around the tree by yourself? 
I was about to tell him I wasn't alone when I saw that my friend was no longer there. She was just a few seconds ago, I swear. It was absolutely extraordinary. I just told the boy it wasn't, it wasn't anything. I just felt like doing it. Later that day, I saw my friend and she came and said, Hey, how have you been? It was like she hadn't seen me that day. I didn't say anything about it or what had happened earlier. But while we were talking, she mentioned that she had spent the break in her classroom talking with some of her friends, which was true because I asked them later, and they corroborated her story. This made me think I was crazy as it was impossible that she could be in two places at the same time. Several years have passed since that day and I still can't find an explanation for what happened, and I have never told anyone about it. I still don't know if it's something supernatural, a glitch in the matrix, or if I just imagined it, but I do know what I saw. I would appreciate it if anybody would know, or happen to understand, what's going on. My Stories While Sailing by SDS19 I've been sailing for four decades now. Mainly, I sail alone. I like to go out and just enjoy the ocean as well as do a fair bit of fishing. I have a smaller boat for such things, nothing fancy or big, but big enough to get around and be comfortable enough to sleep in during the short stints that I would sleep. In all my years of boating around and sailing the Atlantic, I've never had an encounter quite like the one I found myself in during the trip I'm about to speak on. First off, being that I sail alone, I generally don't sleep for very long. Depending on where you're at and the preparations you make, you can sometimes get some real sleep on the sea. But I've always trained myself to sleep no more than two hours at a time, as I've always been worried I'd wind up off course, or worse. I'm familiar enough with the ocean, I've comfortably slept here and there for eight-hour periods, but I've tried to make no habits out of that, because it's definitely not safe to do so. That's a long story though, and I'm getting a bit sidetracked. Anyway, for the purposes of keeping my identity private, from henceforth just call me Dave. The ocean is a beautiful place and in my opinion, it's a world of its own. Sail the seas long enough and you'll find that when on land, you're itching to go back out again. For me, having done this sort of thing for most of my life, it has gotten to the point I consider the ocean my home. Life on land is alright but there's nothing like the thrill and adventure of the unexpected. The ocean provides that in spades. On this occasion, I had been out at sea for about a week. It was late May in 2012 and I was fishing and relaxing. The days had been good to me and I was grateful for another opportunity to be out on the ocean, taking some vacation time off work. The day went wonderfully and the week was coming to an end. I would need to head back in a few days to make sure I got home on time to be there for all of my obligations. Night had eventually fallen, and the forecast called for high winds and unsettled ocean, with some rain. This is nothing I'm not used to handling, but I decided to try to make it through the night and the storm before attempting to sleep. Everything was calm till about 9pm, when the sun had completely set itself and the storm had actually come upon me to the point that I felt like I was in some sort of movie. The waters were rough and the storm certainly made its presence known to me. This didn't bother me in the slightest and I was fully prepared to handle myself until I heard her voice. I lost my wife to brain cancer roughly seven years prior to this event. She was the love of my life and I had been with her for over 30 years when she passed. She used to go with me on my lengthy excursions out to the ocean and she was and is the only woman I would ever and ever will want in my life. The voice I heard was my wife's. I'm positive of it. I was wide awake and this happened. And at the first bolt of lightning, I swore I saw her, like you might see someone standing just in the distance. She looked real, and she seemed to be trying to tell me something. I obviously was very perplexed, and I thought initially that maybe sleep deprivation was getting to me. I remember refocusing and looking around me, only to realize that the wind was picking up immensely. My radio was beginning to dip in and out, and my boat was beginning to be slammed. Keep in mind, as I said earlier, my vessel is nice and fully capable of handling the waters, but it's also smaller, and only now did I realize the storm was much stronger than the initial forecast said it would be. 
I didn't panic as the weather taking a sudden turn is fairly common. That said, I did try to radio out and as I did, I got nothing. The next thing I knew, I looked up in time just to see a large surge of water hit my boat and knock me off my feet. I tried to turn the boat, but it was too late. Before I knew it, my boat was flipped and I was thrown into the ocean. I remember trying to get my head above water, popping in and out, taking short breaths before BAM! I was hit by another massive wave and being dragged under. I fought with all my might and fury, swimming to the surface again. Gasping for air, I looked up and saw my wife. I could faintly make out two words. Keep swimming. I know how crazy this sounds. On instinct, I trusted my wife's voice and I swam in her direction. I had no way of knowing for sure if this was really her or how it was even possible. But in my heart, something told me to keep swimming her way. I was hit with another blast of water from the ocean. Everything was backward. Up was down, down was up. I truly felt like I was, I was lost. Still, I pressed on, swimming with every bit of strength I had. Looking out and gasping for air, I could see my wife once again. She wore the red dress she wore the night we celebrated our 30th anniversary. I just remember, focusing on her and not really thinking about anything else but trying to keep afloat. The truth is, reflecting back later, part of me did wonder if I died there would I be reunited with her. Still, in the moment, I was too focused on her image and survival to give up. I pressed forward and swam with all of my might. If it weren't for her guiding image and her voice, I'm sure I would have been completely lost. I went under and would lose my way, but would always be able to follow her voice. I probably would have swam circles until I died. Thankfully, as I got closer to my wife, I felt a renewed vigor well up within me. It was because of her, and to this day I can't explain how, that I'm still alive. I swam in her direction for what felt like forever, and I'm sure at least was an hour until she faded. She faded before me within a few feet. She was close enough that I could reach out, but upon trying to touch her I only saw her sweet smile and then she faded. Instead of her skin, I felt the water of just a few feet further in front of me. My boat was sitting upright again, bobbing around in the ocean. I was able to reclaim my boat soon after. The storm died down. And honestly, I'm not really expecting anyone to believe me, but that night, I believe my wife saved me from beyond the grave. I can't explain it. I don't know if it was her ghost, my mind playing tricks on me and using her image to keep me... I don't know if she was a ghost my mind playing tricks on me and using her image to keep me going, like some kind of weird survival trick, or if it was something else entirely. But to this day, that is the strangest and most dangerous thing I have ever done on the ocean. The trip back home was uneventful. I never heard my wife's voice or saw her again or ran into any other storm or problem. I still go boating today on the ocean, but I wouldn't have been able to survive that night without her there. I won't pretend to know how or why it happened, but I'm thankful it did, and I hope when God finally does decide it's my time, that she'll be waiting for me in the afterlife. Something is in the ocean by Squid Vicious USNA. Being in the Navy, you get to see a lot of the world, and with two deployments currently under my belt, I have seen a lot of crazy things. However, this occurred during my last deployment, and it's a moment that I will never forget, not just because it left me physically shaken, but because there was no explanation for what we saw that night. I watched from midnight to four in the morning, and my watch station is in a little area right behind the bridge. In this area, I was the supervisor of a small team of four others, ensuring they did their job correctly, which was to make sure we knew where other ships were, who they were, and where they came from. The midnight watch is usually dull, as nothing really happens around that time. The bridge team tended to keep to themselves around that time and only came to bug us when they had questions about a ship or any possible ships in the area. We had one person out on the bridge to talk to the lookouts and people stationed around the ship who made visual reports to the bridge on other boats or any marine life near us. To ensure I knew what the lookouts were reporting, I hooked up a speaker to the station that guards used to talk to each other and make reports. Usually during this time, the lookouts like to talk about nonsense and gossip amongst each other. 
although I will admit a lot of their conversations were funny. On this particular night, however, one of the lookouts made a report to the bridge, and I knew something was wrong because she sounded highly nervous. Here is the initial statement. Bridge? Port Fantail? Go ahead, Port Fantail. Bridge, the, the water behind us is, uh, glowing. Say again? I can't explain it any other way, but the water is glowing. What the hell? I said to myself. I went out to the bridge and talked to my guy, ensuring he also heard what I heard. We both reported it to the junior officer of the watch, or the J-O-O-W, and he thought it was weird as well, but claimed that it might be bioluminescent algae. Although, uncommon, it did make sense to me. I told my guy to return the word to lookout, hoping it would calm her down. As I returned to my station, I heard the lookouts talking through the speaker, teasing and making fun of her reporting glowing algae. After that, all seemed normal. About 20 minutes later, I heard the lookout come out again, talking to one of the other lookouts. Starboard Fantail, Port Fantail, yeah? Do you see the water glowing in the distance? Uh, yeah, what about it? I think it's following us. <laughs> You're stupid. No, no seriously, look, look, look at it. We passed it about 20 minutes ago. We shouldn't be able to see it anymore. You're either really tired or paranoid. You need to calm down. After that, the lookout again reported it to the bridge and this time to the J-O-O-W, told him to pass the word to inform him that the glowing algae was getting closer. I went outside to check it out and even I saw it. Although it could be nothing, I was on edge. Then, out of nowhere, I know the glow rapidly was getting closer to the ship, coming in from behind at a speed that made no sense for it to be algae. I ran back inside and heard the lookouts making the report, but before I could inform the bridge, the water around the ship started to grow intensely. The glowing faded slowly, then got brighter every few seconds, and everyone on the bridge was utterly dumbfounded. No one moved or spoke a word, they just stood in place watching as the bridge filled in and out with this ominous green glow. This went on for a couple of minutes, but felt like an eternity. I don't know what the others were thinking but I thought this was the end. We then watched as whatever was glowing beneath the ship slowly moved away from us, moving ahead of us. Then, in a sudden flash of light, it was gone entirely. Everyone on the bridge remained silent for about another minute, and even though everyone was shaken up, we all tried to get past it, and many went on like it never happened. Since there was no official report of the incident and it was never passed down to the other watches, this event technically only happened to those who witnessed it which happens more than you would think out in the open ocean. The captain should have been informed of what happened. I have not been able to stop thinking about that day and I haven't told anyone about it, not even my wife and family. Not because they won't believe me, but because they worry about me constantly when I'm out at sea. So I've kept it to myself until now. I wanted to share what I experienced and pass the word on to the swamp that there is something in the ocean. What is it? I don't know, and that truly terrifies me. Central Virginia Spookiness by Janie Bowe I grew up in a densely forested rural area in Central Virginia, and like most kids my age, 10 at the time of this story, I spent a lot of time playing in and around the woods. My best friend and I found a creek one day while exploring different deer trails through the woods. This creek we happened upon was a rare find, and the perfect spot for us to play. It was wide and deep enough to swim around in, and had nice, soft mossy banks on either side to rest on after we had tired ourselves out. The water was cool and clear, with no copperheads and no mosquitoes because the water was constantly running. We were psyched. After a few hours of swimming, we had to walk back home for lunch, but made plans to pack lunch the next day so we could have a picnic on the creek banks and spend the whole day there. The next morning, we set up for the woods at around 1 p.m., planning to have the picnic first and swim after. We entered at the same spot we had the previous day and followed what we thought was the same deer trail. It was not. At the point where we should have found the creek, we walked into a small clearing that was covered in a huge thick ferns. We had never walked past this before, so, being both hungry and tired of walking, we both decided to eat in the clearing. We laughed and played around there for a little while, 
spitting watermelon seeds at each other from our lunch. It was an absolute blast, and we were both in wonderful giddy moods. That all changed, however, as soon as we packed up and set out to find the creek. As we walked on, the woods started to feel darker and colder. We got skittish, and I noticed my friend kept whipping her head around to look behind us. After about an hour of walking, we came upon what looked like an entire overgrown bathroom. The sink, toilet, and bathtub, all sitting arranged together and covered in ivy. It is common to find weird stuff like this in the middle of the woods, so we just walked on and made jokes to lighten the mood, calling it Bigfoot's bathroom. After another hour of walking, and not seeing anything we recognized, we started to panic. Instead of trying to reach the creek, we were now just trying to find our way back home, or out of the woods at least. I told her we should follow the sun, and eventually we would come up upon a road or someone's property where we could find help. She insisted on trying to find another way, and we began yelling at each other out of fear, and let's be honest, little girl bossiness. I told her if she thought she was so right, she should just go on her way, and we would see who got out first, so we split up. Now, as an adult, I can fully acknowledge I was being a stubborn brat, and a bit of an idiot. The worst possible thing we could have done was split up. Not even ten minutes after splitting up, I began to hear someone walking maybe 100 feet behind me. Thinking it was my friend, deciding to go my way after all, I slowed down so she could catch up to me. Instead, whatever it was matched my pace. I slow down, it slows down. I stop, it stops. This went on for what felt like hours. The whole time I was going back and forth on whether it was in my head or it was really something following me. I picked up a big stick, swung it a few times to make sure it was sturdy, just to make sure that if I had to hit somebody with it, it would last, and trucked on. As it began to get dark, I came upon something that made my heart sink into my stomach. It was Bigfoot's bathroom. I had just walked in a huge circle for hours, despite being 100% sure I was following the sun west the entire time. Confused and frustrated, I sat down on a log and just screamed my little heart out while smacking my sticks together repeatedly into the ground. As I tried to collect myself, I heard footsteps again, walking up on from behind me. I called out my friend's name, as loud as I could but got no answer. Then, after a short pause, the steps began to run towards me. I jumped up and booked it as fast as I could in the opposite direction. Now, this is truly the horrifying part which I typically omit while telling people this story. As I was sprinting through the darkening woods, I began to hear what I thought were church bells. I looked up to see the darkest, deepest cloud I have ever seen in my life. In the middle of it, it was so black, like it was looking into the night sky, and the dark gray around it seemed to be swirling. It gave me a horrible feeling to look at, almost like nausea. What sickened me further is that I realized the sound of the bells were coming through the hole in the cloud. They were definitely loud. I mean, really booming out of this thing. When I realized this, I stopped dead in my tracks. I felt a sense of absolute and overwhelming dread that has gone unmatched in all my 24 years on this planet. Something in my head began screaming that if I do not run away from whatever the hell that cloud was, no one would ever see me again, and I would be gone. I did not want to run toward the thing, chasing behind me either though, so I made a sharp right and took off away from both. It was now completely dark, and I was running blindly through the trees, smacking through branches, wheezing and tripping every few feet for what seemed like another hour, until I smacked into something low and flew over it, hitting the ground so hard that the air in my lungs was knocked out of me. As I lay there trying to recover, I realized I could not hear the bells anymore. Then my eyes adjusted to the dark, and I realized what had just made me go ass over teeth. It was an old fence. Grabbing hold of it, I prayed that it would lead me to a farm, and sure enough, it did. I walked up over a hill about a mile to get to the farmhouse, explained what had happened, and the farmer graciously gave me a ride back home. I was covered head to toe in scrapes, oozing blood, and was more exhausted than I had ever been in my entire life, but I was finally safe. It was past 9pm when I finally walked through the front door. 
My friend had gotten back home shortly after we split and figured I had as well, so I hadn't told anybody I was lost, and my family just figured I was still out after dark, which wasn't very uncommon for me. They were shocked when I walked in beat up and crying. No one had been looking for me at all. To this day, I wonder how long they would have waited to come find me if I had not been lucky enough to find the fence, and if it would have been too late.